Hey y'all, welcome, welcome back to Inner Stage Window, my Saturday stream, which is always with my friends. And today we have with us Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. <laughs> All right. And what are we talking about today, Landon? We are finishing up Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince. Last week, we talked about all the good, all the things we liked. I got to go on a Draco Malfoy rant. Mm -hmm. um, but this week, we're going to get into the stuff that didn't hit it, didn't, yeah. didn't go off well. <laughs> yeah, last week we talked a lot about the the children characters, right? And this week, um, and 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 Hogwarts and things like that. And this week we're going to get more into like some of the things that happened to the adult characters in these books, as well as the effects of like zooming out on the Wizarding World that happens in um, the Half Blood Prince, especially. So, um, with that being said, here you go. You guys can see the beautiful slideshow now. So yes, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince part two. If you would like to watch part one, especially if you are watching this on the VODs on YouTube, you can find that. If you go look on my videos tab, there is a part one of this stream. And I will also make sure it's linked at the end of this video. So yeah, um, lots of fun stuff this week. So let's dive into it. Let's get into it. Well, first and foremost, we want to say here at Interstage Window, we are not spoiler free. So there will be spoilers for the Harry Potter series and all of the extended works within the Wizarding World. Uh, so if you get angry at spoilers, this is not the stream for you. Go read the books, go watch the movies, come back after. Mm -hmm. Um. We also want to warn our listeners that we will be discussing discussing topics involving dynamics of past and continual abuse, and there will probably be topics brought up that are problematic views that JKR brings up in, in her books, and we'll be discussing all of that. So if you would prefer not to be discussing transphobia and anti-LGBTQ, again, this might not be the top, the show for you, it might be brought up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And in this stream, we are going to do some focus on um, what this book means for the politics of the wizarding world. So there's definitely going to be some politics that get brought up, um, you know, so uh, probably not as much about abuse, but maybe a little bit. We're not really talking about Harry this stream. So only only a little bit of abuse, a lot of politics. <laughs> we'll be talking about Severus Snape, which is abuse right there. So. That's true. That's true. So it'll come up when we talk uh, about Snape. But the word fascism will probably come up once or twice. <laughs> At least. <laughs> And then in addition to that, of course, we want to acknowledge that we do not agree with J.K. Rowling's um, statements. She needs to stop tweeting, please. Um, 2022 challenge. I know she's already failed, but like she could pick it back up halfway through the year if she wants. Um, J.K. Rowling, stop tweeting, please. So um, for these streams, as always, if you would like to subscribe, if you would like to give bits, if you would like to give a tip, you are welcome to do that. But we encourage you to either instead of or match that with a donation to the Trevor Project. Uh, right now, J.K. Rowling still has a lot of political power in a lot of her views and a lot of her statements and a lot of the direct money that she gives, and we are not here to contribute to any of that. So that's that about that. Yep. Um, again, to the Trevor Project. It is Pride Month, so it's a good time and opportunity to open your wallets for those of you who can. But of course, we are here for free entertainment, so don't feel like you have to in order to enjoy and, and communicate in our streams. That's right. That's right. All right. Let's do the thing. Let's talk about our favorite things. Okay. Uh, so Karen, get into it. Tell me more. Okay, my favorite thing is the Sectum Sempra spell. Okay, so we're doing favorite things again, of course, because there are still things in this book that I think are um, good that are relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. So Sectum Sempra. Up until this point, the books have kind of like been very, um, you know, whimsical and childlike in the way that violence is enacted right up until this book but in this book we actually get a spell that's like damn 
wow, that's vicious. That's violent. That's you know, hard. up until right, <laughs> like up until now, we have had um, things like the Imperious Curse. We have had Avada Kedavra. You know, things of that nature, but we haven't seen them enacted in a direct way. We haven't seen Harry interact with them in quite a, a visceral, emotional way as he does with Sectum Sempra. He learns this spell off record, right? Like no one teaches this to him. He figures this out himself, right? He's being, he's being like a little bit, a little bit of a, a freedom fighter, a little bit, you know, Googling how, how to make bomb, right? He's doing a little bit of that. He learns this spell Sectum Sempra. And Harry in, four um, in his only. Oh, four enemies only in his very um child teenager view of justice and revenge decides I got some enemies I got some enemies one's named Draco Malfoy and um the results in the movie scene as you can see here which I actually think that this scene in the movie version like the adaptation of of the way that Harry interacts with this spell is so incredibly well done like you feel um the way that he thinks about like really should i do this the way that draco reacts to it and is kind of affected by the sectum sempra spell um i i wish we had more of this you know as i was experiencing harry potter as it was coming out by this book I was almost like at the stage of being too old for Harry Potter in a way. Like I was kind of like, I was kind of in the process of growing out of the canon of Harry Potter. It had been, it, it started getting written slower and slower. And, um, and I was just kind of like, it, it, had, it had lost me a little bit. So this element of this book, I was really interested because it kind of touched on a thought that I had kept having in the earlier books. Like if they have all this magic, and we have wizard Nazis, then why don't we have like the wizarding world version of like, you know, all of the things that go along with World War II, right? When we think about chemical warfare, we think about like atomic bombs and kind of those terrible atrocities that we developed, um, the, the technology that we developed. Where is the terrible wizarding world technology that resulted from their world wars like where is that and sectum yeah. sempra was just a little taste that like oh that could be okay that could be and for somebody that was very invested in the harry potter fandom and expanding on it and um and uh sort of dissecting it this was kind of like oh it felt like an open door to like okay yes i can explore these things and think about like a better way to do this, something that was more accurate to the World War II allegory that Harry Potter um, tries to be, right? So love Sectum Sempra. I think it's great. Um, I wish we had more is the only kind of downside to this. I uh, kind of like going back to, to what you said as far as like magic is up to this point has been whimsy. This is also the first time that we see physical violence in any sort real, of physical violence, like real physical violence, like direct. Um, because we see, we, or at least from human, human on human physical violence, I should, I should clarify, because the stakes haven't ever been that. Even Cruciatus, like, which is supposed to be this painful, the most pain you've ever felt, nothing actually physically happens to your body. It's all internal. Avada Kedavra kills you all of a sudden. Imperius takes over your mind, but there's still a chance that you can fight it if you are strong-willed enough, Right. So this is the first time that we genuinely see like someone get their hands dirty. Um, and I think that it's also incredibly shocking because Harry's getting this advice from a book in which he trusts. Oh, apparently my mic is still fuzzy. It doesn't sound super fuzzy to me anymore. You did have a moment where it was, but okay. I think it's like, I just need to be careful to not talk over you or maybe we can move your mic a little closer to your mouth. Um, but I'm looking at the levels while I'm kind of listening. I, I think whatever it is went away. Okay. I moved it a little closer. So hopefully that helped. Um, but it really, I think, does a good job of all of a sudden taking the reader into this stark contrast of being like, not only do we trust the writer of this book who's been giving advice to Harry along the way, or the writer in the margins, the half-blood prince, 
but we also haven't seen any physical violence or any gore of any kind. So all of a sudden we are slapped in the face with both of these things coming together. And it was a really, it was a really interesting scene for that purpose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Definitely one of my favorite moments of the book. And, um, and yeah, the only downside in my opinion is that just like, I wish we had more of these, right? Like I wish we had more of these. I wish there had been a little bit more grit um, and, and gutsiness in Harry Potter. And, uh, and I do know we recommended our rec- book recommendation last week was, uh, was getting Hunger Games. And I, and I remember like reading Hunger Games and like feeling so refreshed, like, oh, oh, hey, you know, this is a character's fighting against oppression. And it is like very, um, it, it is much more visceral than, uh, than it is in Harry Potter. So yeah, I appreciate Hunger Games for that. And, and I, I like Sectum Semper. I just wish we had more. So that that is my favorite thing. Um, Landon, what is your favorite thing this week? Rab, I think that this is such a punch in the gut and a way to really lead off into the new book. Because so far in all the Harry Potter books, what we really have is the school year ends and Harry goes home for the summer. And that's just how it's been right? He's going to return to Hogwarts in the fall and he just has to endure a summer with the Dursleys. This is the first time that I really feel like a cliffhanger has been like introduced into the Harry Potter books where we are given information about the context of what the next book entails while like so like there is actual purpose to it there was actual thought this is the first time I feel like JKR actually like laid down a scene or a seed in a previous book for it to grow in the next one uh and that is R.A.B. uh and this note that Harry gets after all of this fighting after all of this turmoil after adventure and facing the Inferi and having to force you know Dumbledore to drink a potion that ends up weakening him and then watching Dumbledore die and then fighting the Death Eaters out there in the school there is this thing a moment of victory that he has that turns out that he doesn't have it at all and it really starts the wild goose chase that would be the seventh book and I love it for that reason. I remember seeing this um, upon first read and this just like jacked my hopes up and my expectations up for the final book. I was like, oh my God, the final book's going to be so fucking cool. Spo- I, spoilers, I had a lot of issues with the final book. We'll see how I feel upon reread. Um, <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk about that in two or three months. We'll talk about that. But <laughs> the whole mystery of R.A.B. and what this sets up with the Horcruxes and like, oh, Harry has to come up with his own plan now because all we have is this letter to go on and Dumbledore's not there to help us. And oh my God, who is R.A.B.? Yada, yada. Like, this little snippet, this letter, like set my expectations so high for the final book. I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. Like it didn't matter to me at the time that the politics didn't make any sense. Um, also like I did was not politically aware enough to realize some of the things that upon reread upset me. <laughs> but I just remember this part, like, like just like blowing my mind. And I'll tell you also, it's so funny. I actually have a coworker that's around my age that um, never managed to read Harry Potter as a kid, never saw the movies. She has an interesting kind of story about how that happened and, and why her that's life awesome. was. Yeah. So she actually read them recently. She had a 2022 challenge for herself. She's like, you know, I've managed to get this far without getting spoiled for Harry Potter. And everyone my age has read Harry Potter and has thoughts and feelings about it. I feel left out. So she decides she's going to, for 2022, read Harry Potter. And she just last week finished the last book. And, you know, it was so, it was such a joy to see her go through these and the feelings that she went through because upon first reread, you're not thinking that deeply, right? Like you're not, you're not. And, um, she was so like hyped for the final book and, um, and she's still like experiencing all the emotions. Like, I can't believe they did this, that, or the other, right? Like upon first read, and she's like a very kind of like, um, always tries to do the right thing type of person. And so she is very much like, uh, she did not like Draco, right? She did not like Snape. So <laughs> she has a, she has a lot of feelings about how that, how all of that ended up, but just, she had like a lot of hype around this. And it just really reminded me about how I felt when I was first reading them as a kid, um, about this particular passage. And it was just kind of like, oh, 
I do wish I could capture that feeling again. <laughs> I, as much criticism as I have about the Harry Potter books, as much as there is a lack of depth to them as you go in, I do genuinely believe that they are a classic children's and YA literature and they will mm-hmm. remain that way, not just because of popularity, but because of how they are written and that that yeah. is the universal experience, even 20 years after the books have been published, mm-hmm. that someone in their, you know, in in their 30s, I'm guessing this person's in yeah, their 30s. Yeah, yeah, she's in her 30s. In her 30s can still have that same like, same reaction as pa- our parents had when they were in their 30s reading it 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that we had as kids. And I think that that is just something that's really cool. And this is a prime moment of it. And there's so many emotions attached to it. And I think that it's one of the deepest this is one of the times where Harry feels the most true of character that reacts truly to character where he is all of a sudden, all hope is lost. We have hit rock bottom. This is beyond hopeless. And now I, I, the fight is on my shoulders and I have to do it. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, um, and yeah, it's still, it's still true. This is still like a really great and- part of the book. I'm thrilled that it happened in the sixth book because if it hadn't happened in the sixth book, it would have felt like an afterthought if we had opened the seventh with it. This Mm -hmm. is the first time we're really connecting books and I appreciate that. Yes, I totally agree with you. All right, shall we move on? Let's go. Okay, you guys, guess what? We're here we go. Snape kills Dumbledore. Do you remember... I remember, I remember the viral video of all the people on the sidewalk outside the bookstore and the asshole drives by, Snape kills Dumbledore and the absolute like screams that erupt from the crowd. Do you remember that video, Landon? I do. I actually watched that video a couple weeks ago because it like showed up on TikTok. It's crazy. Mm -hmm, It's mm -hmm. insane. Mm -hmm. Uh, That guy is a fucking asshole. And but he wasn't now, the only one. <laughs> no, 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 no. Absolutely wasn't the only one. But that was like the pinnacle example. Um, but even now, it feels weird to sit there and be like, Snape kills Dumbledore. Can we talk about that yet? Are we allowed to talk about that? Uh, We're I allowed mean, to talk about it. We're allowed to talk about the it. Biggest, this point. <laughs> the biggest plot twist, I think that it happened certainly in the fandom, but also a huge monumental plot twist that every no one saw coming or a lot yeah. of people didn't see coming. Yeah, let's talk um, about that. Let's talk about that. Okay, so the fandom did not see this so, coming. We were shocked. Can we I just say shocked. something? Yes, quick? yes. Because I see the screenshot. Fuck what the movies did. Fuck what the movies did as far as like letting Snape see Harry and then being like, shh, don't tell anyone. I'm sorry. The whole point of this plot twist is because we needed to know that Snape was bad. We needed to truly believe that. And as soon as you're like, actually, Harry, you and I have a secret. You ruined the whole thing. Sorry. That's a no, you're totally just- right. <laughs> you're totally right. That little, that little <laughs> moment, that little <sighs> moment of them in the basement together. And Harry has that like confusion on his face. Like, wait, why is he? Why? Doing? What? Huh? Like it muddies everything. It muddies everything. It takes agency away from Harry. Like the whole point of the scene is that Harry is literally trapped. He is literally unable to move because of magic. But in the movies, he's just like standing there watching the whole thing happen. Yeah, he just chills because Snape told him to. It's so dumb. I hate this part of the the movies. Anyway, sorry. I saw the screenshot and I just was filled with rage. (laughs) (laughs) No, you're right. This is definitely one of those moments that's like, worse in the movies because we kind of go back and forth right whether the movies um do certain things better or the books do certain things better and i do think there are things that the movies do better um but this is like a very clear example of where i think the movies play it wrong they play it so wrong so wrong yeah um but yeah no i mean we are we are led to this point in the books so to to remind you if you haven't done a recent reread um snape has been acting sus this entire time But Snape is always acting sus because he's the greasy, dark haired guy in the basement, right? We don't talk about Uncle Snape because he's sus. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And so Harry, like we, we read in the very, in the second chapter of Snape making an unbreakable vow that he will protect Draco and finish his job if he must. um, And he is willing to, to sacrifice his life to do this. 
Mm-hmm. And we have no and idea what Jacob's job is. And it's a very contentious scene because um, Snape mm-hmm. gets accused of being a double agent. Um, he assures everyone in the room that is nobody's fucking business. That's between him and Voldemort, and you just need to stop. And yeah. um, and then he and and basically. It is it is this connection between him and Narcissus, because the whole point of the scene is to show that Snape's allegiances are not necessarily set in stone. Dumbledore might not be right because he is willing to protect to make an unbreakable vow to protect Draco, which means that Snape cannot go back on that or he will die. Right. So it's it's something yeah. where he is putting potentially and he knows this going into it, he's potentially putting um his his uh, allegiances to the dark lord over his allegiances to dumbledore and the rest of the wizarding community right so we see him do this harry doesn't know this part but, also, but we do as readers and we also in the scene get recognition for something that happened in the previous book which is that snape didn't der- didn't automatically go to to uh to voldemort when voldemort rose and called him on the uh death Death Eater's Mark. He didn't automatically do that. He waited. Uh, he waited until after um, everything happened with the with the hospital wing, mm-hmm. in order to keep it to seem like he was still on Dumbledore's side. And he acknowledges that in the book. Um, and that as as readers connect that scene and connect that understanding and remember that you know Dumbledore and Snape have a brief conversation about this is the time for Snape to go so it is muddying this water because we're also like well Snape was told to go by Dumbledore late to that meeting but Snape has now played and convinced Voldemort that that by doing so Dumbledore now thinks that he's his guy and so like we're starting to get a little confused but there still is lenience towards no Snape is Snape is good Snape works for Dumbledore Dumbledore is never wrong and as readers, we because of all these things going on, we really don't know um, no. where where Snape's allegiances lie. So so yeah, if you don't kind of rem- remember too much about it, that's how that goes down. So I want to comment about what Koneko just said next because this is a point I wanted to make too. So uh, me me um, you know kid reading this book, I think I was in in towards the end of high school or or beginning of college at this time. I'd have to look at the year to tell you specifically. Two thousand five. Yeah, two thousand five. Okay, so I was I was just starting college at this point. Not de- not um, developed enough in my media literacy to to not be surprised by this. I was totally surprised. Upon reread, it feels kind of silly to be surprised because um, this type of character always dies. Okay, Dumbledore always dies. Obi Wan al- always dies. Right? It, it, because it's a hero's journey, and a hero's journey story. Once it's time to really truly execute the real mission, you gotta kill the mentor because the hero has to do it on their own. The hero can't have help from the mentor anymore because it's time. The real shit's gonna happen. Okay. So it does amaze me that we really didn't see this coming. Like there was no, um, there was no indication at the time when we were all being like shocked that this happened and that this went down the way that it did. No one was saying like, um, guys, but like, he's the mentor character. Of course he's going to die. But like, even the, the way I remember it anyway, even the people that thought Dumbledore would die they didn't expect Snape to be the one to kill him. I think that that was the thing because also like, yeah, I give myself a little grace with this. I was, I was in fifth grade. I was 11. Oh yeah, you would have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew Dumbledore was going to die because you're right. That's a popular trope. It's, it happens in almost every other YA. It happens in a lot of media that if a coming of age story means that the person who is your mentor is guiding you through this journey dies and you have to do the last bit on your own. Very common trope. Knew that that was going to happen. The fact that it was Snape who did it. Snape, who we had been convinced and been told the entire five, six books up until at this point was good, turned out to be bad. You're right. Looking back on it, we're like, no shit. But at the same time, we're like, wait, Dumbledore was not wrong about a single fucking thing throughout any of this. Any of it, Dumbledore wasn't wrong. And he was wrong about this. That's shocking. That is shocking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and then it turns yeah. out that he was not then it turns out that he wasn't wrong and it was a whole plot and anyway <laughs> but we don't know that at this time at this time we don't know that <laughs> yeah. and there are like big old arguments online 
um, about whether Snape is going to turn out to be a good guy that was on Dumbledore's side all the t- all the yeah. whole time, or whether no, he really was playing Dumbledore and he was a Death Eater the whole time. Like we really legit didn't know there were heated debates about this, and not just online, but in real life. Like there was a a stark divide between what where people thought the story was going to go in regards to Snape. We had no idea collectively. We had no idea. Yeah, and it was it was interesting because not only were there like things and going on online, but I remember specifically uh, the unofficial guide to Harry Potter. Did you ever hear of these things? I don't know. Tell me, tell okay. me the full story. So, so it's basically a book. It's a book that was published that was a basically a thesis examination of each Harry Potter book. Um, and so the fifth one came out with Snape with this one about six months, maybe maybe seven months after the for, the book was published, and basically went in depth, scene by scene, of all the reasons why Snape was good or Snape wasn't good. Uh, it was basically a how to navigate the fandom guide, um, and they're actually published. They're published books. I don't I don't have it. I have it at my parents house but I don't have it in my current library um but it, they're fascinating and I remember reading this like and I'm talking I'm talking like it was as thick as the Harry Potter books for this for this particular book and most of it was like this topic of whether or not Snape was actually good or Snape was actually the betrayer it's because that's all we were talking about that's like it's all we everything. were talking about um it was everything. constant it was constant um it never stopped <laughs> So yeah, we didn't um, know. We really collectively, we didn't know. Had no idea. And it was, it was this big twist and this big, it was, it was a good, it was so satisfying. And like as a writer, looking back on it to sit there and be like, wow, you caused such an emotional reaction as a writer. And that's in my eyes at least, everything that you want to do as a writer is cause emotional outbursts. Uh, and she did. It was the it was the spell heard around the world. <laughs> yep, it really was. It really was. So yeah, super big twist. Super big twist. There is a little bit more that we want to say about this death, though. Um, and we would like to talk about this in regards to how it affects other deaths in the Harry Potter universe. So the truth is, when it comes to Harry Potter, most of the deaths do not matter. They are just there because it is a war and people die in a war. And you cannot write this this World War II allegory without some of your characters dying, right? So we have characters that die, but most of them are not like the characters that are the kids that went to Hogwarts, right? Like only one of the twins passes away. We have, of course, um, Hedwig dies, which is like, oh, my God, I'm so not looking forward to read that, reading that part of the book. I mean, I am in a way, but I'm not in a way because, oh, my God. <laughs> um, so I but when you think about the deaths, there are other deaths that could have been chosen. Like we talked about this in regards to Sirius's death, like the book could have been written in a way where it was Arthur instead. Now, I do think Sirius was the right choice, and I do think that's the better choice. But there is only one death in the Harry Potter universe that had to happen to make the points that um, that J.K. Rowling wanted to make. And, and that's Dumbledore. It is, I would argue, the first and only death that you could not rework into going a different way. Like it had to be this character and it had to be this way to illustrate what I believe is the whole point of Harry Potter. Yeah, Cedric Diggory, like, we'll walk us through the deaths. Cedric Diggory. Yeah, oh, Cedric Diggory. First. Okay, so we got Quirrell, which is the first official death, right? Mm-hmm. But he's so written off when he dies. That yeah, we, I that forgot. I forgot even that was even a death. That he's, that he's not even a death, right? He's not considered yeah. a death. And he was the villain, uh, and it so nonchalantly does not bother Harry at all um, that he murdered a man mm-hmm. by touching him. Uh, <laughs> And then we go and we fast forward to the fourth book where we have Cedric Diggory Uh, and Cedric Diggory dies. And the reality is is that that graveyard scene could have 100% been done without Cedric Diggory dying. 100% could have happened. Uh, Harry could have touched the cup first, gone to the thing. Everything would have happened the exact same way. It added horror to the scene. It added intensity to the scene. It didn't add anything plot relevant to the scene. I do appreciate um, it though. It was great. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, 
and and then we have our next one which is serious and again could have been arthur weasley she had considered arthur weasley i think what Sirius's death does is it sets up harry's character in the right place but plot wise fucking doesn't matter no not really right like serious serious could have disappeared on a mission and, and it would have done the same thing mission and harry would have been the exact same place as he would have been starting the sixth book mm-hmm. right it's just that serious would have been gone or busy rather than serious being dead uh this is the first time that this death happens that changes not just harry but everything around him it changes mm-hmm. the world mm-hmm. um and yeah and relatively the only time that it does that as well yeah um everyone else dies because it's a casualty of war Dumbledore died because he needed to die yeah and I think that um the only the other because we don't have a situation in these books where like a quote-unquote main character dies right not really like Ron there's no there's never any idea that that Ron is is gonna die there's never any idea that Hermione's gonna die there's never any idea that Neville's going to die right or Luna or or Ginny right these characters that that by the end of the books have kind of become like the main group right there's no there's no chance of that and um and looking looking back i do kind of like almost wish that um the horrors of war would have been a little bit more explicit and i think the way to make it more explicit would have been to make one of those main characters be one of the casualties but we don't which means that really this death with dumbledore is the most impactful the most plot relevant and really the only one that really is out of all of the deaths that we have in the series uh, yeah, I just want to shout out to Kinokio, uh, Kinoko. Um, Kinoko, that, yes. Kinoko. Uh, yeah, same. That Sirius's death doesn't feel like a death, right? Like, even up into the seventh book, I was like, oh, I can't wait until they go into the veil and get Sirius back. Uh, oh, it needed to be explained to me that the veil was a metaphor for death. Uh, and are we sure that he's just not living in a pocket dimension somewhere? Um, I've read some fics where, you know, I'm just saying, like, that happens. It's not even, that, at that point, it wasn't even fan fiction. At that point, for me, I was just like, yeah, that's that's how this happy ending is going to happen, right? Uh, so there was never really an emotional impact. Sirius was just gone. Mm-hmm. Um, but Dumbledore, I think also, it's interesting how they led up to it, knowing that he was hurt the entire time of the sixth book, that his that his hand had been decaying and dying, um, that it ended in him falling off of a tower and just laying there in the grass. I think there was also something incredibly powerful about that choice as well. Yeah. Um, Because the deaths we had seen at that point were serious going into the veil and... Uh, Quirrell disappearing into nothing and Harry having to carry Cedric's body back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think probably for me, the um, before this point, the death that had impacted me the most was Cedric's. Um, I mean, Mm -hmm. serious dying is very tragic, of course, but, uh, but you're right at the time there was a lot of us that were not really sure he was really dead and we're pretty convinced that we were going to go get him back. I don't remember thinking that like the way I remember it, like I really did think he was gone, but I definitely remember reading some fix where they like went into the veil to go get <laughs> serious back for one reason or another. A lot of times it was wolf star reasons. I'm not going to lie, but, <laughs> uh, but they did that, you know, in the fic. So there was definitely this thought out there that like serious isn't gone. He's in the veil. That's not the same thing. Yeah, it's but not, not with Dumbledore. And Nobody thought he was coming back. Nobody thought that. No, it was finale. It was final and fin- and and finite. And I think that there is also something reflective. That again, fuck the movies for this. But there is something beautiful that JKR does by showing us their powerful characters dead as humans, mm-hmm. like just in the same way that all the other not as powerful people die Mm -hmm, uh she mm -hmm. does it with dumbledore specifically and she does it with voldemort the movies don't but the books do and there is something like that harry's just looking at dumbledore and being like he could be asleep 
he looks like he could be asleep now how he looks like he could be asleep after falling off of a tower that is several hundred feet in the air is beyond me but I'm not a physics professor I am a writer (laughs) so instead I'm really I'm really thrilled by that symbolism that she chooses to show our our immortal forever characters as they fall to just be the men that they are I would agree with that. I do think that, and we'll get to this in the next book, that um, Voldemort's death scene, I remember, like, really struck me as, like, very (sighs) uniquely, uh, a very uniquely beautiful and satisfying death scene because of the fact. (laughs) Yeah, we'll talk about that next book. But I I totally agree with you. And Dumbledore's death is very similar in that way that you're just like, it's a gut punch because he's just, he's just a man. And this was eventually going to happen, no matter what. And like to see, and for Harry to be able to see that, I think is vitally important too, Mm -hmm. because Dumbledore, I mean, this is also the, mind the pun, this is the fall of Dumbledore, because he, this is also the first time that Harry really sees Dumbledore as human. Uh, He can be killed. He can beg for his life, because that's what Harry thinks that he does, is on the top, he begs Severus please as in Severus say like don't do this save me keep me alive and Snape betrays that and then Dumbledore falls off the tower and is dead and that is such a human thing to do for a man who seemed so inhuman to Harry so much larger than life and then we go into the next book and again we'll talk about the fall of Dumbledore in the next book as well but then Harry starts to discover in all the ways that Dumbledore was a flawed human being uh, and that this is just the beginning of that and I think mm-hmm. that there is there is a nice little carryover crossover there too like sure. this is the, again this is the first series the books that feel like that it's a part of a series not because you need to know what happened the year prior but because the things that happened in the book before really do lead to the things that happen in the next book Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and Dumbledore's Dumbledore's death is one of those yep for sure all right last point on here we would like to talk just a little bit about um how this sets up Harry as kind of Dumbledore's soldier right this is something you see in the fandom a lot to try to reconcile the character that um, that it seems to us that J.K. Rowling believes Dumbledore is versus what's actually on the page that's in the text, right? Because there's a disconnect there. And we've talked about that before, so I won't belabor it too much. But Dumbledore's dying, the whole point of it is to set up Harry as somebody that's going to continue to follow what he believes Dumbledore would want him to do. Because if Dumbledore had died in some kind of non-violent way, if it had not gone down the way that it did with Snape and with it being like a betrayal and ultimately him being, you know, seen as a, as a human at the end, then it would have been a lot easier when Harry starts learning the truth about Dumbledore's life a little bit more in the next book for him to kind of potentially not carry out what it is that Dumbledore has set him up to do. So um, Harry has a lot of like over the course of the books, um, growing, waxing and waning faith in Dumbledore, you know, com- uh, contrasted to his own anger about the situation. But this really sets him up as like, no, I have to do this. I have to do this. Well, there's also this like beautiful scene of after everything is, after everything has happened, after Harry has discovered RAB or the locket is RABs that they are no farther than they were before the this tragedy um where he is sitting at Dumbledore's funeral and he is like clutching the locket in his hand so hard he's almost bleeding and he notices the I must not tell lies scar on the back of his hand and then he goes and he he like sets himself to realize that he needs to break up with Jenny that he needs to like move on and figure out what is next that like there is a result like the scene literally happens where dumb where like they're at his funeral and harry's like nope this is mine to carry on now uh and only then does he like then he's like oh actually my friends could help i guess they're volunteering to help (laughs) 
Uh, and then Ron's like, yeah, but we have to go to a wedding or else my mother will kill me. Um, but it's Harry's moment of just like, like you, it's such, such a cinematic scene, um, which is why it makes me so angry that they left it out of the movie. Uh, because it is like this moment of just like grief, making a decision, hardening yourself and, and going on to live in the honor of the person who just died. Yeah. A two part again, movie. A two-part movie, and they still managed to leave stuff out, whatever, anyway. (laughs) Well, this one wasn't two parts, but uh, that that was the very ending of this book. Yeah. Um, But again, it's it's such a such a powerful moment of Harry turning into the soldier he was always meant to be. Um, And now Dumbledore had no more tools for him. So now Dumbledore needs to die, and it's Harry's job to go forth. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and he's really bad at it. <laughs> That's what we'll discover in the next book. Yep. We discover just like most um, Hero's Journey protagonists, even though they are the hero, it is impossible for them to actually do it on their own. <laughs> Harry's turns no out, exception. <clears throat> turns out Harry doesn't know anything. <laughs> um, but no, right. it's, this whole, it, it was incredibly well done. Um, even if now looking back on it, we're like, oh, yeah, no fucking shit. Of course. Yeah, duh, it had to go <laughs> down this way. Hindsight's twenty twenty, though, you know. Eh, it's fine. We're older and wiser and all that. <laughs> That's right. All right. Let's talk about the man himself, though. Okay. So I want to acknowledge before we go to this section that we did do a lot of conversation um, right. on Severus Snape in, the, in a previous episode about the first book. But that was kind of like thoughts on Severus Snape, um, you know, as relevant to to that point. So much has happened with his character since then. We felt like we needed to revisit him. So Landon, before we do, if you could refresh our memory on what it means as far as like Severus Snape being the Half-Blood Prince, because that's the mystery in this book. We find out the Half-Blood Prince is actually Severus Snape, you know, so what does that, what does that mean? How does that go down? Half so we learn a lot about Sirius's history or not Sirius Severus's history in the last few books, but specifically in this book, and we learn uh, who the Half Blood Prince is is a person who's writing in the margins of an old potions book, who's giving helpful hints and basically rewriting uh, instructions on how to better produce potions, as well as writing spells that is being created in the margins. So. What ended up happening is that the Half-Blood Prince is in reference to Snape's heritage. Uh, Snape's mother was a pure-blood witch. His father, who was incredibly abusive to him, uh, was a muggle. And his mother's maiden name was Prince. So the fact that his mother and father were a pure-blood and a muggle makes him Half-Blood. Prince being that he had more in line with uh, and more in common with his his mother's side and history rather than wanting any association with his father. Um, so we, we really learn that that is something that he struggled with th- through school. He was sort of into Slytherin. Uh, he wasn't popular or well-liked uh, throughout his time at Hogwarts. In fact, we had learned in the fifth book that James Potter Severus or Sirius Black, Remus Lupin, and Peter Pettigrew bullied him uh, as much as he bullied them. Um, And there was a huge rivalry between James and Severus. And that's what all of the spells were for that had been written in the margins of the Half-Blood Prince book. Um, but, But it's the first time that we get an insight into Snape's character without relating it to Snape so that our bias isn't judged at the at first mm-hmm. because we really think that this half blood prince guy is really fucking cool he has cool spells he is really smart he's giving like decades later giving advice on how to help Harry through things um and then we all we come together and we realize that the person who has like been helping Harry this year is actually the person who's been tormenting him for six years Yep. Uh, and um, <laughs> and the other thing that this really shows us about Severus Snape is like what we have seen up until this point, and this is most of what we touched on last time that we talked about him. Severus Snape is a terrible teacher. Okay. Yeah. He is god awful. Why the heck is he at Hogwarts? Okay. He well, is 
there's a, the, he has to be. That was his deal, well, right? He like, has that was to the be. Whole thing. <clears throat> right. So he's so there's there's a couple of reasons he's at Hogwarts. He's a double agent, right? But why do why would the anyone accept him at Hogwarts? Um, like the parents and things like that. Why aren't they trying to get rid of him when he is this um, incredibly terrible teacher? Like you don't, you don't see any, and not, not that parents are really super involved in the Harry Potter world, but as we know in the real world, when you have a terrible teacher, parents will not stop calling the principal to bitch about that teacher, right? And none of this happens in Harry Potter. So we wonder why. Well, we kind of find out in this book that a big reason why is because Severus Snape is a truly talented wizard incredibly talented he he um, has the ability to craft his own spells he has the ability to look at a potions recipe and improve upon it just like you know, a master chef would right he has these abilities that it's very obvious not every um capable wizard can do these things that severus snape can do so he almost became for me the type of character that's like because remember I was at the beginning of college at this point. There are plenty of college professors that are terrible teachers. And the whole reason that they're college professors is because they're there for the research part of their job. They're there to research and publish, and they really don't care about teaching. They they just teach the classes because that's part of the gig. But what they really want to do is the research and publishing part of working as a professor at a college, right? So that's kind of what Snape is. As far as like, why the heck does he have this teaching position? Well, because he ain't there to teach, my friend. He's there to research and publish. You know what I'm saying? Well, like, also in that he has a blood oath with Dumbledore. And well, yeah, 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 whatever. You know what? <laughs> Anyways, so <laughs> where is the potions by Severus Snape? I feel like if there wasn't a war going on, then that book would exist in the Wizarding World. And in my heart, it does exist in the Wizarding World. And, you know, J.K. Rowling just never thought of it because, like, well, yeah. that's yeah. who he is. Absolutely. There would have, I mean, he would have, I, th I think that that also speaks to Snape's character and his potential that he got caught up with the wrong crowd. Um, that he got caught up with the wrong crowd. He was, you know, bewixed by people who actually liked him or seemed genuinely interested in him. And then it turned out that they all were fascists and racists. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then he had to make the right choice based off what we don't know at this point in the books, but what we will find out, uh, a sacrifice for love because the person he loves is in danger. Um, and so having to do all that, he almost sacrifices his own future and he stands in his own way because i 100 percent think that if snape allowed himself to be happy there would be a potions like he would be a, a famous potions master and he's not mm -hmm. um and also because jk probably didn't think of it <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> one person can't think of everything right um but but i really do believe believe that because what this kind of clues us into uh, as well, is that like magic is not some set thing in the Harry Potter universe. You can, with work and magical understanding, create your own spells, create your own potions. And it's been told to us, right? Like we've been told in previous books that like, oh, random wizard name created this or random wizard name discovered this. Like we've been told these things. But in this book, we see it. We see someone's notes um, that, that are the result of their actual process of doing this. And remember, at this time, Severus is a kid. So he's doing this as a literal teenager, right? Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine as an adult what that means. Like, imagine a world where Severus Snape actually gives a shit about teaching and how freaking good at potions the kids at Hogwarts would be. Like, they, if Hogwarts would be churning out potion master after potion master after potion master if Severus Snape had any teaching skill whatsoever. Exactly. <laughs> Imagine. Um, I also think that there's an interesting idea there, too, that, that there's an interesting interaction that really shows how rare Snape's ability as a kid was. And that was when Harry is talking to Remus Lupin in the book about 
this about the spells that he's fighting in this old book uh and and remus basically just says well spells go in and out of popularity which is true which makes sense right like that's how how things happen kind of like language cool um but severus snape knows exactly how harry got these spells and who it is that is doing them because as soon as harry does semper 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 spectrum well nope sectum sempra sectum sempra you are close sempra. thank you i am mixed up consonants um as soon as he as soon as you know everything with malfoy happened he basically said go get your school books because snape knew mm-hmm. snape 100 knew um because snape did create these these weren't just popular and then not Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that magic functions as their their version of technology, right? So you let you ask like, you know, um, why don't we uh, do this or do that anymore? You know, and it's it's just like, well, tech, po- what's popular with technology? What resonates with consumers and what people, what um, companies are, are creating? It it changes, and in the same way in the Harry Potter world, um, the fashion of spells changes based on you know who's using what, who's publishing what, who's um, promoting what, and teaching what. Right. So Severus knew that like Sectum Sempra was a very unpopular spell that he had created and he had never really published it or pushed it and no one else had really come up with it. And so he knew like, oh, Harry must have my old potions book because how the heck and heck else would a child figure out the spell? They wouldn't. <laughs> they wouldn't. Not Harry. I mean, Harry's gifted in a lot of ways. Um, spell casting ain't one of them. As we know, his yeah. very favorite spell is um, Expelliarmus, <laughs> you know? Harry. Harry is a sorcerer. Let's be honest. At some point, Harry just is like inherently good at magic. And then we have some people in the world that are like, no, it's actually important that we take this seriously and like study it and find out how it actually works. Mm -hmm. And Harry's just like, how it actually works? I point my wand and say words sometimes. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, Harry's a jock. You know what I'm saying? Harry's a jock. jock. And uh, and Severus is a nerd. And it's just, you know, it is what it is. His father was a job. Uh, that is something that I always wish had, like, Harry had put together, and maybe it's best that it didn't. But, like, the idea that Snape had enemies when he was 16, the person who was Snape's enemy was James Potter, in mm-hmm. the way that, like, in the way that uh, Harry's enemy is Draco Malfoy. So, this spell wasn't being used on some dark wizards or during the war. This spell was being used on his father. And then he ends up using the spell on someone else. And it just is like such a cool parallel that I wish was acknowledged in the books, but it's not. Yeah, I don't know what I don't know what effect that would have had on Harry. Like, how could you have Harry acknowledge that in a way that would actually be like impactful and interesting it. and not like debilitate him? I don't know. But that would be cool. I would have found it, I would have found it interesting, but that's because I'm an inksmeister. <laughs> yeah, I would have found that really interesting too. Um, But no, I think that what this really reveals is Snape's ability and that it's interesting that he has been, that he is so reluctant to be in the position that he has been in. Because part of this also we find out is that Snape has never wanted to be potions master at Hogwarts. He like he can he can be the research professor all he wants, but he doesn't want to be teaching potions. He wants to be teaching defense against the dark arts. Um, mm-hmm. but he's inherently amazing at potions. So like, I I can understand it to an extent of being like, well, it's like an astro- it's like asking an astrophysicist to teach kindergartners math. Uh, and I'm sure that the character is also like why (laughs) don't you understand what don't you understand about these directions they're simple um but at the same time it's an interesting it's an interesting insight into his character to know that the thing that he wants is not the thing that he is inherently talented at um he's great at defense against dark arts as well but it is that there is a depth there that is very interesting now that we know how amazing Snape is, and it's in quite Harry tragic. Potter. Yeah, it's quite tragic. It's quite tragic. Like, um, being, I think anyone that's a creative person can relate to this. Where maybe you're you're a creative person, and you know you've been doing 
X a while, like you've been drawing for most of your life and you're really good at that, or you've been writing for most of your life and you're really good at that. But you see, you know, other people doing the art that that you're not doing, right? You see them doing that other craft and you want to learn that other craft so badly, but you realize that like, as you're kind of developing it, that you're just not that good at it. You're not nearly as good at it as you are at this other thing that you've been practicing since childhood. And I think that is a is a deep feeling that most creatives feel. I know I definitely feel that in regards to like um, visual art. I would love to be able to draw. And, but the truth is at age 35, the amount of time and effort I would have to put into it, I do not have. It does not. It is not afforded to me under our current economic system. So I will yeah. likely never do that as much as I crave to be able to draw. Um, you know, I, I, that is not a craft that I have time to develop. So very similarly, happen. very similarly, like for me, like, it's not even an idea of time for me. It's, I don't have like the inner, eye, like I can't picture things in my head. I, I think in words, I don't think in pictures. And so like the idea of being able to recall what a fox looks like and then draw it is fascinating to me. I will <laughs> never be able to do that, even though it'd be so cool to do that. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think um, most artists are doing that though. I think they, I think they're using references. People that are saying they're not using references, I don't think are, I don't think they're really telling the truth, no, but that but doesn't matter. But like, I can't like, yeah, I mean, it just, yeah. I think that there, there does require some, some, something in your brain to work a certain way to be good at something the same way with words and writing. Like yes. I, like there are times where I'm like, what do you mean you can't write? Anybody can write. And then I read an 11 year old's writing and I'm like, you can't, you're absolutely right. <laughs> 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 these are just words on a piece of paper okay you did what I asked perfect um <laughs> no but I think that that is it Snape has that and that it that adds to his depth in such a subtle way that it makes me appreciate this character because I've never been a Severus Snape fan yeah I'm, I'm this I'm the Snape fan but for whatever reason Landon is not <laughs> I can't stand full grown men who bully children. It's just, it's, that is, that is my but life. You're, but you're here for Draco. So when a kid does it, it's cool. But when oh, an adult does it, it's Yes, strange. when a child is doing it to another child, it's fine. When a full ass adult is bullying a 12 year old, I'm just like, man, <laughs> can't do it. But then I like Lucius Malfoy too. So maybe that's not it. Um, <laughs> but I think that there is, there is something that, that really lends to JKR showing her hand that this is her favorite character. And she tries to pretend like Snape is not her favorite character, but Snape has more love and time and attention put into him than any other character in these books. Don't believe it. I don't believe it. You know what I mean? I mean, who, who would have written Snape the way that Snape is written and then casted Alan Rickman, who is way, way, way too old for the role and the, who didn't like love Severus deeply? Yeah. Anyway. No. Yeah. And, and and took the time with it, and I think that it really it really does show. And I think actually her, I think since her publication, her empathy for Snape has improved. I agree quite a bit. Uh, I think that as soon as she started having to go on her tour of Snape is a hero, not a villain, uh, she started believing that. Mm-hmm. And that's made her love Snape even more. I would agree. Um, but I think she always had the capability here. And I think you can tell because of how Snape is written and the nuance that is required to understand him. Yep. Great character. Great character. character. Love him. Hate him. Great character. <laughs> <laughs> I can hate a character and still see that they're exceptionally well written. And that's what's <laughs> True. Okay. All right. It's so. time. Okay, you guys, as you know, it's time for our ad break. So this is your time. If you need to get up and have a bathroom break, if you need to go get a snack, go get a snack. Um, but if you stick around, then we would love for you to hear about our sponsor today, Audible. <laughs> Audible.com. Uh, Audible is a, if you don't know what Audible is, I don't know where you've been, what rock you've been living under, but can I stay there? Uh, Audible is in a, uh, book reading library basically where you can purchase 
audiobooks to listen to instead of read because sometimes you just don't have the time to read. Sometimes you don't have the energy and being able to have something read to you, so much more fun than actually reading a book. Um, and I wanted to finish our tour of the classic YA novels, which is kind of what I picked for this theme for this book, since this is the ultimate YA novel in the Harry Potter series. And I wanted to do another classic, which was The Maze Runner. Uh, the series came in a little bit later into the YA Renaissance scene, uh, but it's a fun story of a boy who basically just wakes up in a maze with other boys and uh, it turns out that it's a government facility that are running experiments on them. Um, and they have to find their way out. And then a girl shows up for the first time ever. Uh, and that means everything is different. So I think it's a really classic YA uh, book. And it's one of the YA books that got only one movie, even though it's four or five books long. <laughs> And then, no, it got a sequel. There was like two movies. I swear I saw a second movie. It was not good, though. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know if the book series continues to be good because it, it just like the movies. Well, when the second movie was bad, I'd only ever read the first book. And then I was like, maybe I don't need to read the rest. <laughs> no, 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 no. The, the books are the books are pretty good. Um, mm. They're very YA and obviously, but in the same way that like Hunger Games is top tier, Maze Runner is a little bit down below top tier, but it's still really fascinating uh, and a great series, in my opinion. Very cool premise, by the way. Maze Runner has That's one of the cool coolest thing. YA premises, so I'm so glad you picked it. But if yeah. you would like, if you would like to listen to an audio version of Maze Runner, I've linked it in the chat. And if you would like to support Interstage Window with your listening to Maze Runner, then please sign up at audibletrial.com/interstagewindow. You get your first thirty days for free and you help out the channel a little bit when you do that and your first 30 days for free means that you get an audiobook that's right yes you get one for free when you sign up so get your free audiobook guys um yes this is new lunar lunar we've been doing this for all our media episodes well for a couple for the past several months it's very it's very uh, easy to miss because it's a very quick segment. So oh yeah, it's very quick. No, but yeah, we've been doing this for a minute, but only only on um, the interstage window episodes that are like the that we actually put a lot of effort into. And it's also mostly just so I could talk about what books I want people to read. Book recommendations, yes, book recommendations. So There's so many book recommendations, um, but yes. All right, shall we get on to the next part? Yes. Okay. So for our second half of today, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Let's talk about politics. Okay. So on this book, I began to fall out of love with the Harry. Oh, thank you so much for the howl, Luna. Thank you so much. Um, I began to fall out of love with Harry Potter. And the reason why is because I was getting older and Harry Potter wasn't keeping up with me. But when I go through my rereads, I still have a more negative feeling of these later books, just like I did when I was a kid, but for slightly different reasons. Now I have negative feelings about these books because there's scenes in this book where it forces you to start to consider the wizarding world outside of Hogwarts. So for example, at the very beginning of this book, you have a scene where the prime minister of the UK has a meeting with the um, basically, I can't remember what it's called. The name has escaped me, but the prime minister of the wizarding world, right? They have uh, a minister meeting. Of magic. Minister of magic. That's right. With the minister of magic and the prime minister, they have a meeting. And so it's like, oh, I have to now think about the wizarding world government interacting with the government of the UK. Huh? What does it mean? Okay. And so I'm being forced to think about this. At the same time, the way that this is handled inside the books, I do not believe is correct. And we've talked about this a little bit, but it really comes into view in this book. So it's pretty clear that Harry Potter is a World War II allegory, right? Voldemort died. Voldemort's coming back. It's exactly, you know, like the world wars. Oh, you know, we beat these kind of like 
awful fashy ideas. Oh, they're coming back full force. We have to beat them again. We have to beat, you know, the Nazi fascism. We have to beat Italian fascism. We have to beat Japanese fascism. You know, we have to do it again, right? So that's what's happening in Harry Potter. You got to do it again, right? And we talked about this a little bit in our um, episode where we talked about the Order of the Phoenix. So just in case you need a little refresher, in reality, anti-fascism is a movement that comes up when fascism becomes popular. So when fascism rises up, you have anti-fascism rising up beside it to try to push it down. And those organizations are typically not full of cops, but for some reason in the wizarding world, wizarding world Antifa is full of cops. That's Very good. confusing. Okay. Aren't cops, aren't cops the good guys? Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> um, so very strange, right? Um, and then we kind of go through this where we have to beat up the Death Eaters, right? The Wizarding World fascists. And when we do that, it's like we save the day and we go back to the status quo. But this makes no sense, okay? This makes no sense because in the real world, we had World War I, we beat them, we went back to the status quo, and then World War II happened. And the whole, there, but there's a reason in the real world, we don't have a World War III. Okay, so here's the reason. The reason we have not had a World War III in the real world, even though we have clearly not beat fascism, we know this, there's a lot of fascist organizations in the real world, but the reason we have not had a World War III is because our world, the, the nations, the nation states of our world are incredibly economically interconnected, okay? We can't just cut off Russia, okay? We can't just cut off China. We are dependent on them. We are dependent on every other country in the world continuing to do their little chunk of capitalism, whether that is being a producer or a consumer or, you know, wherever it is that country falls. And we are so interconnected and so dependent on each other that if any country decides to not do their job anymore, the whole thing basically falls apart. And that's why in the modern world, we don't really have communist countries. We don't really have like full on socialist countries. We do have social democracies where there are, you know, safety nets for some countries better than in some than others, yada, yada. Okay. But when you think we about also, like, it's also, go ahead. We it's also important to recognize that we have countries that call themselves communists, but are not. Yeah. So there's only two countries I can think of that are really anything close to um to to i guess real communism right and that would be like cuba and vietnam those are the only countries that really make an effort to try to do communism and even in those countries uh as as communist as they can be within their own borders the way they interact with the outside world is still capitalist and they still have a lot of capitalist mechanisms going on even inside their countries so that they can be interconnected. Because again, we're all dependent on each other. The modern world does not run by itself. Like America can't close off to the rest of the world and still survive in the same way that we do now. We can't, even with all the land and resources that we have in this country, even as rich in population and resources as we are, we could not do that. We could not maintain our same standard of living and close our borders. We couldn't, right? So it's this also, is in the real, go, go ahead. I was going to say, it's also an important reminder that uh, other countries rely on us as well, which yes, is why yes, yes. a world war against us. Yes. Well. So this is why in the real world, World War Three has not happened. Okay. And probably won't. I know we have like the big conflict going on between Russia and Ukraine right now, but it would be unlikely that that would truly escalate to something on the level of the, the two world wars, um, even as that conflict progresses. And, and it is likely to continue and get worse. But this stream is not about Ukraine and Russia. OK, I just wanted to acknowledge that that is going on. And in case anybody's like, but what about that turning into World War Three? Well, anyway, it probably won't because of economic interdependence. OK, now. 
in the wizarding world. They they beat the they beat fascism. Okay, they 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 beat Voldemort down. They kill enough Death Eaters that that they're all shamed into hiding or arrested. Right? Okay, yay! And then we have the epilogue, and they are back in the status quo. Okay, everybody, uh, you know, Har- Harry's a cop. Um, Ron's a cop. Uh, Hermione eventually becomes Minister of Magic. Right? Cops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like. Um, you know, everybody's married, everybody got kids, you know, everything is back to the status quo. Everyone's married in a heterosexual relationship. Oh my god. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> uh, there are no gay people in El- in Harry Potter. Uh, no, ne- the in a couple of weeks, in, in not next week, but the week after we're going to do a shipping episode, we'll talk about some queer stuff then. Um, but <laughs> anyways, so like, all of this is happening. Right. All of this is happening. They've gone back to the status quo. But in the wizarding world, there is not economic interdependence. The different pockets of the wizarding world operate virtually independently. They don't have to to interact with each other. Right. This war that goes on in the UK barely affects other wizarding world pockets. Right. We have no indication that they are bothered by this, they don't send in their troops to help defeat the Death Eaters, you know, because they're scared of it spilling into their borders. Like none of this happens. And there is no there is no economic interdependence between them. There is also very little economic interdependence between the wizarding world of the UK and the UK. They share land, and yet there is virtually no economic interdependence. You go into Diagon Alley and it's this totally separate market. You know, you never see the wizards yeah. purchasing from the grocery store. You know, Witcher, yeah, Witcher, witches and wizards are unknown how yeah. money works. Like it's so removed and foreign to them that it might as well be a different country in a different part of the world. Right. Absolutely. It's almost it's it's it it is like that. It's like a separate country. They just happen to share some land. And so like, okay, if we think about this, the economic interdependence that stops us from having World War Three today doesn't exist in the wizarding world. So why the fuck is there no wizarding world war three? It makes no sense. Okay, because so long as you have a. A, um, a social democracy, which is what most countries in this world have. And so I'll, just a little definition of what that means. What that means is you have some kind of semblance. Um, some of them are better at it than others. OK, some kind of semblance, semblance of a democratic ish system, usually some kind of representative democracy where people vote, yada, yada. Right. Some some voting is better than others, whatever. And then there is some form of social safety net to protect your population so that you maintain enough population to have um, the workers do what they need to do to make the things to do the things, etc. Right. That's how the vast majority of countries currently operate. They have some kind of social democracy that is built um, on maintaining capitalist interest. Right. And there is no indication that the wizarding world is any different Okay, there's no indication that the wizarding world is any different than that. Okay, they have the the bureaucracy of government, just like we do in our world. Okay, there is some sort of social safety net that we are given hints exist because um, there is, as we know, help provided to those who cannot afford everything for school. Right. And yet there is no economic interdependence. And any time that you have a society that's built on it, like fascism didn't exist before because neoliberal social democracy capitalist systems didn't exist. Fascism is a response to the inequality created by those systems where people have decided that the reason the inequality exists is because of some, you know, minority group and things used to be better. Right. That's the basis of fascism. And that's why every country's fascism looks slightly different, right? Because it's it's dependent on that country's history and what groups live in that country. Um, so, in it, and we know this from history, fascism will rise again in the in the wizarding world, and there's no reason to say that it's not going to result in another wizarding war 
because the economic interdependence that keeps us from World War III in our current world doesn't exist. So like, why? Like, just why do I have to think about this? And if the scene between the Minister of Magic and the Prime Minister didn't exist, I would not be forced to think about this, but it exists and I am and I hate it, okay? I hate it. I hate it so much. I have ah. big feelings with Karen. Mm. I really like the idea of being able to expand the wizarding world into the greater muggle world. However, I do agree with Karen that it's done poorly <laughs> and without thought. It should and have been left I'm, to fanfic. It should have been left to fanfic. Yeah, or it should have been thought from the beginning, right? Like yeah. that's a, it should have if it's secret, it's secret. If it's secret, then then there should then no, they shouldn't tell the minister what's going on. They should just let the minister come up with shit. Um if it's if it's secret, then they shouldn't, oh, and I know that this is not the books we're talking about, but then they should have let Grindelwald stop talking about muggle world war ii actually affecting the decisions of the wizarding world like they they should have they should they should not have involved it unless jkr had a idea of it being involved from the very beginning which she didn't she clearly didn't mm -hmm. and because of that and adding it in later which i understand you're seven books in you get an idea but it really does open up a bag of worms that makes no sense on a low level let alone a more complex political level that, that Karen's on. It just, I just, I just hate it because it's just proves to me that JK Rowling has no greater imagination than what we are presented on the page. Yeah. I, I just, because I struggle with understanding how someone can be a creative person person and a person that cares about their fellow humans, which she claims to care, and not kind of entertain some of these political ideas that I'm talking about and not think about those and think about like, oh, well, what if it played out this way? And what if it played out or what if it played out this way? Or, or what if humanity did this or that? And it's just like, I just, it just I blows think, my mind. I think that part of it is that you have a more than average concept of political more than average concept of, of of politics than most people. Well, I do agree with that, but I think that it then so, what that means is that don't write a World War II allegory if you don't understand how fascism works and why the world wars most happened. Are, because most people aren't going to be upset about it. Just well, kind of like the allegory. Just kind of like the allegory with with AIDS and Remus Lupin. The oh, average so dumb. person the average person wasn't going to be upset about it. The queer mm -hmm. kids are, the queer people were going to be because it's the people that affect them. For you, you have the knowledge and that's going to affect you. But for the average reader, for the average 12 year old reader, they're not gonna fucking know anything about, about fascism or the history of fashion. This is actually where they're going to learn it. And that is sad. But I think that that has to do with part of it is that it was, she started, she started seeing the power she had and realized that she could Tolkien this and build a whole freaking universe without actually putting in the work that Tolkien put into his. If that yeah. makes sense. No, you're because absolutely he, right. He was like, oh, there is an easy way that we could do this cool thing and have this cool scene where it interacts with other, you know, Wizarding World people and blah, 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 blah. And she put it in there without any, and she was like, this will expand the world. And then I'll be able to play with any of this and any of the other mediums that I'm going to create within Harry Potter or at that point in time, or it's going to be a one-off chapter and I'm never going to touch it again because after this, I'm not writing Harry Potter again. <laughs> um, and I'll never have to talk about it again. And then it turns out that no, she's going to use this as a base foundation that fucks everything else up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. the reality is, is that how she's trying to fix this now is that the other w magical wizarding countries are interdependent on the Minister of Magic in the UK, because apparently the Minister of Magic in the UK is the leader of all the other countries too. Somehow, uh, but like they're not economically interdependent. 
according to according to the newest movie yes they are which is ridiculous that makes no because sense because that movie takes place in the past anyway i guess i'm gonna have to actually watch it as much as i don't want to so i yes. can know what the heck people are talking about <laughs> well, it's, it's part of the frustration of this is that is that that is the, the creativity is is surface level the, yes. yes the creativity is surface level she's never gonna think beyond and and she didn't and, and she still doesn't she no, still doesn't not. Yes. She and that's sad. And that is what's ruining. I mean, m- her being a turf is what's ruining it most. But most beyond that is the lack of any want to actually build a world instead of just like being like, oh, this is an idea and I'm going to go chase it. Yes, you're 100% right. And I just want to acknowledge like, Rar, you're right. She's writing for kids. But I have two examples off the top of my head of people that were writing for kids that understood the politics of the world they built. And that is Hunger Games, which we talked about. The politics of that make perfect sense. Okay. Um, There's other like little things that are kind of like cheesy in those books, but the politics, the overall politics make a lot of sense. Okay. And it's actually incredibly important that our poli- that our YA is filled with politically accurate representation. Yes. Part of what kids read is what they learn. Yes. Uh, and so the Animorphs. Kids, that's the other one. Animorphs, my friend. Yes. One, so is Hunger Games, um, the idea of capitalism within the Maze Runner. You'll actually take a lot of books that are written for kids and realize that there is a lot of adult, there is a lot of allegory there. And there's also a lot of adult themes. Um, and that's how they're, they're just, they're just taking those themes at an age appropriate level, mm-hmm. which is usually a coming story living in that world it's an incredibly important part of writing and reading YA is understanding that yes and I would say actually that Harry Potter is unique in the sense that its politics are unrealistic I most other YA Um, political YA that I I think think of um you know it's it's dumbed down versions but it's not unrealistic but I also think that's because it was writing without a it was it was she was writing without a roadmap yeah right like like why she was at that point 2005 still I mean at that point the the average the average YA yearly sales was it was close to thirty thousand dollars like it wasn't a huge amount before Harry Potter came in right so so the idea of or the the average like YA books that came out were like close to thirteen thousand instead of the thirty thousand that it is now Yes. Um, so like at that point, there was still no map to rule it. And it was a kind of do whatever you want. Um, but it fucked it up. It absolutely did. And it, it is a frustrating thing, especially as we're rereading it. And especially because this is a book that is completely and utterly serious. That is completely and utterly uh, like protected. And most people won't be willing to criticize, especially the politics of it. Uh, mm-hmm. And that is where it needs to be because the foundation of JKR's politics, which is her turfism, which is her right-wing fascist ideas in some aspects, really do have to, they're written into this novel. Yeah, like she she has, um, and oh, before I say more, because I don't want to forget, thank you so much for the follow Shady Joker. I really appreciate that. Um, for those of you guys that don't know, Shady Joker is a new friend of mine um, that I have been watching a bunch of his streams. I find them really inspiring. They're really good. You guys should go follow. Um, once we have a break in the talking, I will actually do an official shout out because my shout outs play a clip. So um, I don't want to interrupt this. But once we get to a break, I'll actually do a for real shout out for you. So give me a second. Um, but yes, absolutely. I think that this really, it, it proves it's not just her tweets, right? It's not just her tweets or her expanded Wizarding World, um, you know, stuff that she has done. Okay. It's baked into this book. J.K. Rowling's politics are this current status quo. That's what she truly, really believes is like the right thing to do and what we should be doing and is the best system. And I think that's where I really struggle because it just shows that like, it it makes me like really question (laughs) elements of her creativity because I have never met another creative person that doesn't think thoughts that are like, gosh, I wish the world could be better. I feel like it could be better if we did this, this and this, you know, and sometimes they think it in a way that I think is wrong, right? Um, that their ideas would not make the world better, but at least they have those thoughts and she doesn't. I think she does. It's just that those thoughts are telling. Those thoughts are that the cops and the good guys win. Those thoughts are that, um, growing up to follow your dreams 
even as a child of becoming a cop and staying in the system is the ultimate goal. Um, that 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 her creative her creativity I think exists, but it tells on her on a way that we don't like. Yeah. And on a way that is close to status quo. Because I think that's the other thing too is JKR is successful in the status quo. So why yeah. should she anything she, at this point in time with her writing she what I mean she was she was one of the richest women in the world at this point in time already bo- movies were starting to be produced honors were starting to be put in her name she in herself had an entire fandom and a fan force that was behind her and supported every single thing she would do why in the world wouldn't she want to change it she was Harry in that point. She suffered through all the pain that she had to do to get to the dream that she always wanted to have, which was to be loved and adored. Yeah. I don't know the answer, but I know chat's really making me want to go get a candy bar right now. So thank oh. you guys. I really, really want a Snickers because um, I didn't eat any breakfast. I got really busy with doing chores this morning and doing certain things in Final Fantasy. We'll talk about that on Thursday. But um, oh, M&M's. Oh, oh, those are my least favorite, but I would still even go for some M&M's right now. The chocolate and M&M's is not good. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> How are we even friends? I don't know. The only good M&M's are like yeah. peanut ones and the peanut butter ones. The regular chocolate's not I good. Eat. First of all, the peanut butter ones are bomb. Second of all, that's fine. I will eat all of my M&M's, all the M&M's, and you can have all of my Snickers because Snickers are gross. Oh, good. Okay. Well, this is actually a good thing. This is why we're friends. It's kind of like how, you know, so one one person eats the drums on the wing and the other person wants to eat the flats. It's like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Koneko, y'all cracking me up. Peanut M&Ms are the best M&Ms. Yes, Rar, exactly. Uh, first of all, M&Ms and popcorn is the best combination this guy this <gasps> Jun- this, uh, junior mints and popcorn have you ever junior mints in your popcorn it's so good oh, frozen junior mints are supreme agree okay anyways <laughs> jk rowling's politics suck but you know what doesn't suck chocolate <laughs> so, uh, so yeah i just this this book forces you to think about the Louis politics. Day Dream gifted a tier one sub to the Blue Island. It, it's the, ah, it thank you, thank you, Lunar. Channel. Thank you, Lunar. Thank you so much. But yeah, this this book forces you to actually start to think about the politics of the Wizarding World, and that's what I find upsetting. Uh oh, we got some gift subs. Dream gifted a tier one sub thank to you, Lunar. Thank you, Lunar. Love gift you. Subs in the channel. Thank you, um, thank you. No, the politics of this world. It's, oh, we're still going. 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 Oh my god! Nico. Sixty gift subs She's in the so channel. Nice. Everybody's getting little, getting their little subscriber icons. So I redid the icons kind of recently. And uh, no, Hello. you're good, Lunar. We love you. We love you. Keep going. Um, we're actually almost to the end. We didn't, we don't, we, I don't know if we have two hours of content today. So you were like so good. Um, we, I, I redid the icons at one point. So the dragon cat is supposed to represent lady. So you guys have little lady icons now. Oh, lady. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, because she's she was dragon. Remember when when she was much littler, the curly cue on her back kind of looked like a little dragon. Yes. Oh, her kittens grow up too fast. They do. They do. They look very cute back there, though. So thank you so much, Lunar. I love you. Do you know who um, does the politics of war and the politics of international we- wizards? Correct. Who? Fandom. Mm, true. Fandom also. Fandom does a great job with it and fandom makes me interested in the world because Mm -hmm. you know what would change this what would actually be like a change that could be interesting uh is that after all of this it realized that actually muggle london or at least wizarding london need to interact with wizarding uk or with the muggle uk a little bit more than it does currently and that's the kind of fandom shit that i like because you know what (laughs) you know what like would have really fixed this is like in that epilogue, if instead of them sending their kids off to Hogwarts, it was like, you know, them having some kind of conversation about how, isn't it so interesting that we use, um, that we use a muggle money now. Isn't it so interesting that we're not hidden anymore because of yada, yada, you know, um, that we're interconnected anymore. I can understand the hiding, um, but at least like have grocery stores. Yeah. At least making going to like muggle restaurants or having a telephone or TV something normal- something that showed us they were they were they were There's moving that. towards the the political realities of our current world, right? 
Yeah, because at least like that's the tough thing about building a political system. Um, anyone who's out there trying to write a fantasy world, it's tough uh, mm-hmm. because politics are nuanced and hard and uh, there's always something wrong with them. And so if they're not based off of your own or they're not based off of your current world's politics, uh, you're going to fuck up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is very difficult because, I mean, think about it, like politics is is the collective will of every individual's like thoughts and feelings and actions within the world. Like it is v- almost impossible for a single mind to conceptualize such things. Um, so, you know, we're like ragging really hard on JK Rowling, but the reason I want to make it clear, the reason why I rag so hard on her is because I think it betrays how she really thinks, which I think is super um, problematic and dangerous. And I know that it doesn't have to be that way because most other YA authors are not that way. Um, So that's why I rag so hard on her. Not that I think that other YA authors, more realistic politics aren't flawed and don't have mistakes in them. They 100% do. But at least at their core, it's obvious that the author kind of like gets it and has thoughts and ideas on like what a better world could be. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yes. And I mean, I think that that's a whole, that's, it's interesting looking at Harry Potter as the trope of, it's Harry Potter's not fighting for a better, better world. It's fighting against evil world coming in and changing an already good world. Uh, but as we reread it and as we dig into it, the more we realize that the world that is created isn't a good one. Um, and I mean, they have literal so, slavery. Come on. <laughs> listen, JK. Hey, that's where that's where she thought her creativity was. Is that she could free the slaves that she created in her novels? <sighs> I think that um, there was no way to do this right. She just did it wrong, and that's unfortunate. And that, but that's yep. part of the discussion of what we're having here. Is again, it's highlighting that idea of. JKR isn't telling a story that we're meant to walk away from the story with a call to action. There is no call to action here. There's a call to defend. Um, And we've moved beyond what this is asking us to defend. I think in 2005, it was, and with the audience that it had, it was right on the money. That was what we wanted to defend. Um, but that's no longer where we are now. And books like Hunger Games and The Maze Runner and uh, City of Ashes and, and a whole bunch of Animorphs, although I haven't read Animorphs in years. Um, all of those series that came out after, um, I think, had more forethought in where, the, where things were going rather than where they were. Mm-hmm. For sure. For sure. Um, um, I think I've said everything I wanted to say on this. I know we're not that close to two yet, but I think I've said everything I wanted to say. Um, yep, final thoughts. But I want to answer this question from Blue first. Do we think we can ever remove J.K. Rowling from Harry Potter ever? You know, I love the idea of, of death of the author, but the older I get, the more impossible I think that is. I think it is it is very um, it is not possible for people to not write without putting a little bit of themselves in that. And I do think that um, the reading experience can be um, enhanced by understanding where the author was coming from. And it is very clear to me that a lot of J.K. Rowling's soul is in these books. And I can't unlearn that now that I know it. So that's how I feel about that. I yeah. think the death of the author, specifically when an author is still alive and gaining financial gain from uh, the products that she creates is impossible. Um, I think the idea of separating anyone from their artwork is unreli- unreasonable. I do, however, think that there are ways that you can combat that. Um, there are plenty of uh, marginalized people that you can buy artwork from. Uh, you can lend, uh, you can buy used copies of the book or uh, lend books out from their, your library. Um, there are ways that you can critique very much like we do here, uh, the work and recognize the issues within it without trying to excuse it or ignore it. Uh, Every piece of art is problematic. 
Mm-hmm. It, that's just the reality of the situation that we live in and the reality in the world that we we currently live in. If you're going to read anything by a white writer, it's going to have racist, racist undertones in it. If you're going to read any, if you're going to consume art, you are in some way contributing to problematic views. Mm-hmm. However, that shouldn't stop you from doing it. It should just let you invite you to use your brain in ways that you want to do it differently. Yeah. We're all trying our best. We're all trying Absolutely. our best. Yeah. So, so, so final, final thoughts. Do you want to go first, Landon? Do you want me to go first? Final thoughts on this book? You can go first. Okay. Final thoughts on this book. I have a very mixed feeling about this book. Um, I'm a snake girl. Okay. This is, this is clear. I have said this many times in, in different words or in those words. So I, I, I love a book where it turns out the half blood prince was Snape and we learned so much about him. However, this book forces me to think about the wizarding world as a whole. And at the time I disliked it because I was growing out of Harry Potter itself. And I really just wanted to focus on like the Harry Potter fandom and kind of what we were doing in that space, which was far more advanced than what we ended up getting in canon. Is and that's just true because the collective imagination and and creativity of thousands of people is gonna be better than one. That is that is just a numbers game. That is there's there's no way that could have been any different. And then rereading it as an adult, I just I can't not see all of the politics that I so ardently disagree with and that I I think are holding us back as a species. So when I when I read this and I get the deep sense that J.K. Rowling's politics are literally this current world that we live in right now is the best world that has ever been and will ever be, um, that breaks my heart because I believe in the creative spirit of humanity and we can always do better. And I think we should always be trying to do better and not um, pretend that the world now is the best we can ever achieve. I know we are better than that. So this book has got high highs for me. It's got low lows for me. Um, and, and that's basically how I feel about the Half-Blood Prince. Um, Landon, well, uh, I guess I'll say this. Does it resonate? This is where the books kind of stop resonating with me. So that's my final thoughts. Um, Landon, what are your final thoughts on Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince? Does it resonate? This is the book that blew me out of the water when reading this. At this point, I had already been part of the fandom for a few years. I had waited through the long summer, gotten the fifth book, and I got to have this book. And this is the book that came at the right time, in the right moment, in the right way, at the right age. Um, I think that the characters are incredibly well-developed. I think that they make great choices. I think we start seeing insights into things that are beyond Harry, which is something that I had craved uh, throughout the entire series, but also something that didn't make Harry passive, much like the fifth book. Uh, I think that this also in comparison to the fifth book, uh, brought me a lot of joy. I think um, that I we did get to see in a deeper depth into the magic and the lore of the world, which I really, really appreciated and was introduced to more concept, more complex concepts and ideas, uh, which is something that I also really appreciated. I stopped feeling like I was being treated like a kid in this book as it, it rounded the corner into true YA. Um, I think that this is also the height of it, which makes this book a bit bittersweet for me, because as much as I wish that I loved the seventh book, it will never be as good as this book. Um, and it will only be a letdown from here. And the older I get and the more separated I get from it, the more I realize that this that this book isn't as great as I wish it was. (laughs) Um, (laughs) There are things that I still love about it. I think it does still resonate. 
there's a lot of tropes in here, a lot of stuff from this book that I have built my writing around, um, including the action scenes. But I think that uh, as YA develops and my writing style develops, I'm able to let this go more and more. That's really sad, but I do think that that is inevitable when it comes to certain beloved childhood books. Sometimes the things you love as a kid are truly great. And sometimes the things you love as a kid, you love because it came at the right time and place for you and really not due to the work itself. And I will restate what I think earlier is that I think that there is a timelessness aspect to how this series progresses that mm-hmm. Harry Potter will always be relevant to somebody within our society which oh, means yes. I think that it will it will continue to be a classic in YA literature and that it will continue to resonate with kids of a certain age of a certain time experiencing a certain degree of what they're experiencing yeah, I do still think like regardless of of how upset the wider Wizarding World politics makes me in this series, I still would say that Harry Potter as a series, I would recommend to any kid um, around their middle school, high school age, because it still has really strong themes of like, you should just try your best to, you know, Be friendly with those that are friendly with you. You should try your best to stand up to the bullies and the evil of this world. And I think that no matter what, those themes that give kids the power to be like, hey, even if you're a little nerd kid that's put upon the way that Harry's put upon, you still can do the right things in the end, too. Like, I think that that is powerful no matter what. So all the ranting that I do about these things in the book that doesn't take away from what is the main theme and what I still think brings value to kids reading the book. Uh, But also, fuck JKR. Absolutely. (laughs) Well, yep. (laughs) That's always going to be the case at this point. I have to say it at least once per stream. Absolutely. I'm obligated to do it. (laughs) Oh my God. Yes. All right. We're going to end a little bit early today, guys. We are. Let's go ahead and talk about where to find us. So, okay. So you can find us right here, of course, on Saturdays, um, noon to two. Next week, we are doing a community day. We're going to be doing some Among Us. It's been a while since we've done Among Us. Really excited to get to it. It's had some major updates since we last played. So it's going to be Um, a good, good time. If you are interested in joining us, then you need to get in my Discord server. Here it is. Go ahead and pop yourself into the Discord server and get, um, go through the little initiation thing where it asks your age and all that jazz. And then you need the party, um, the party guest role. Get the party guest role. That's the secret channel where you can get invited to party games, which is what Among Us is. Uh, Also on Thursday, I do streams. Those are my solo streams, artistic license. We're playing through the end game optional boss part of Final Fantasy X. So if you're interested in that, you can come join me on Thursdays, 6.30 to 8.30. Um, Next week actually might not be at 6.30. I've I've got some travel for work that I'm doing. I think I will be back in time to start do the stream at the normal time, but I will keep you guys updated on Twitter and on Discord if the stream time is going to change. And if you would like to watch any of my VODs, did you... Landon, did you know that we have over 24 hours of Harry Potter content on my YouTube channel? Did you know that? That's a lot of time. <laughs> that is a lot of time. So we have spent... Oh, no, over- and we're not finished yet. <laughs> we're not finished yet. We've spent over 24 hours talking about Harry Potter, you guys. And if you would like to see more, you can go on my YouTube channel. There's a Harry Potter playlist. And, um, and you can, you can hear, you can hear all the fun things. Twitter is my main social media. You can follow me on there. That's where you can make sure that you're getting all of the latest updates. Um, the other reason to join my discord server besides joining into community days is I can actually control the notifications in there. So if you want to make sure you always get a ping whenever I go live or whenever a video is posted on my channel, then you want to get in my discord server as well as of course, You can hang out and chat with me instead of just on the streams in the server. So that's all the stuff about me. Oh, if you want to support me, you can do so in all of the normal ways. I do things just like every other Twitch streamer does, um, subscriptions, bits, and um, tipping down below in the about. 
So that's all the stuff about me. Landon, where can everyone find you? I'm still, I'm still just reeling from this. Hold on. Sorry. I need a second to process. I never thought that when I sit there and I say I could talk about Harry Potter for days on end, uh, that I'd have proof that I could do that. Anyway, that's super fun. Um, yep. You can find me on Instagram on at Land in Maine. I'm also on Twitter at Land in Maine. Uh, it's summer vacation. So if you want to watch me having fun and doing things, that's where you can do it. I am not producing much content these days, but sometimes some writing stuff pops up every once in a while. So we'll see if that happens this summer. Yep. Uh, and that's it for me. Also, All right, come, you guys. Uh, come play Among Us so that I can pretend not to be the uh, the person. Wow, what's the what's it called? The um the uh, shoot. What is it called when you're the villain in that game? Oh, the imposter. The imposter. And I promise I won't kill you, or maybe I will. <laughs> All right. I want to do um Shady Joker shout out because y'all should definitely go follow him. He does a lot of RPGs and stuff like that. So if you like to watch my Thursday streams, especially, you will like Shady Joker's stream. So here we go. Shout out for Shady Joker. It'll play a little clip for him. Yes. Yes. It's 10 a.m. now. Wait, you haven't been to bed? I'm back for the timeout. Like I said, I always have a death wish. Oh god, I wish I could hear Sath right now. I wish I could hear Sath while she was playing Mario Kart. All right. So go give him a follow. Um he is a good streamer and like what happens on Saturday. I need to make more friends that stream on Saturdays cuz like what keeps happening on Saturdays is like it's time to end stream and like no one is streaming. So I found um a channel that is called Perry Hotter. <laughs> And um, it just 24-7 plays uh, Harry Potter uh, video games. And just it's just a, a stream of those. There's no commentary or anything. So if you'd like to keep the Harry Potter vibes going, we're going to raid into Perry Hotter TV. Um, so that is the stream for today. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we really, really appreciate it. We have one more Harry Potter book. It might happen in... Um, August, I'm not sure because of my move. I will let you guys know once we know when we're doing the streams for the last Harry Potter book. Or September. Maybe maybe September. August or September, most likely. We'll see. Um, all right. So thank you guys so much. Of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, guys. See you later. Bye.